This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. The following is being brought to you by Remote Transcription. In the process of doing radio broadcasts heard around the world, discussing and debating philosophy and religion with university students from coast to coast, from Harvard and Yale to Berkeley and UCLA, I have frequently had students say to me that they wondered what real difference a series of beliefs in transcendent spiritual realities would make in day-by-day -day life. I respond with an observation from nature. There's a stream called Strawberry Creek that runs through the University of California campus, and I used to cross a footbridge over it every day, and I noticed that from time to time the color of the water in Strawberry Creek would vary enormously. Some days it would be sparkling clear, others cloudy, and on other days deep brown with mud. But I found the reason. Some of those days, road builders were at work upstream with considerable dirt from the project clouding the river, and that accounted for the differences. The principle is this. I could tell what was going on upstream by how it looked downstream. And so it is with human existence. What happens in the higher realms of your experience, in your religion, your spiritual life, in your ideas and ideals, will make an enormous difference in the rest of life, in the way you deal with decisions, the way you treat people, the way you do your work and your play and your waking and your sleeping. It is cause and effect, reason and result. For as a man sows, said the master, so shall he also reap. There's an old story from Scotland. But one sunny day there was a shabbily dressed elderly Scotchman to be seen climbing up Carlton Hill in Edinburgh. And there at the crest, he sat down and looked across the green rolling hills, the blue sky and white clouds, and down to the water below. And as he sat before all this beauty, which lay spread before him, an expression of deep peace and an inner radiance seemed to come across his face. And after a while, another man who had been watching all this from nearby became so intrigued by curiosity to know the old man's thoughts that he came over and spoke to him. And the old man said these words. He said, I'm a shoemaker by trade, and I live and work down there in the city, and it's an unclean neighborhood. There's swearing and drinking and fighting on my street every day and far into the night. And so, he said, every now and again, I just climb up here and sit for a while to remind myself that I am not all flesh. And so it is. Remember well, you are not all flesh. There are higher beckonings of spirit within the mortal mind. The kingdom of God is within you. May there be moments every day in prayer, meditation, worship, and praise to remember we are not all flesh. We were born for eternity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Some years ago or so I've read there was a barber's convention being held at a large East Coast hotel. And as a publicity stunt, they sent a committee down to the city's skid row to pick up the most slovenly-looking drunkard they could find who had agreed to be the subject of a project which was to consist of a total alteration of that man's appearance. They found and paid a willing subject to go through the process, brought him back to the hotel where the newspapers photographed before and after pictures, and proceeded to give him a bath, replace his soiled and wrinkled clothing, gave him a shave, haircut, manicure, decked him out in a black tuxedo with tails, white tie, top hat, the change was amazing, and the before and after pictures were astonishing, and he received a tumultuous ovation from the Barber's Convention. But as I read the story next morning, one of the newspaper reporters went out to do a follow-up article and found the same man back on Skid Row, dead drunk, sleeping on newspapers in an alley, and still wearing the tuxedo now ruffled and soiled. The man had been cleaned and groomed externally, but internally his attitudes and aspirations, his spiritual life, had not been reached. Neither barbers nor tailors can touch and transform the inner soul of a person. That is the domain of God. And it is through synchronizing the human will with the perfect will of God that an individual really begins to live as he or she was born and created to live. And one of the greatest prayers in the Old Testament is create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And wrote Paul, be you not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. In the first chapter of the book of Genesis, in the Bible, in the story of creation, 
the creation of the world and the solar system, seven times you come across the following phrase, and God saw that it was good. Again and again, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. This is a good world and a good universe. And the very source of all reality is a God so good that to taste and see is to know that God is good. And all the varied and multiform experiences of human life commingle in a vast spiritual confluence of purpose in the mind of the everlasting God. And for one who knows and believes this truth, all of existence, life and death and life again, are good. Some people will complain to God about their situations, complain to God about their circumstances, complain to God about the world. There was a certain farmer driving his wagon along a dusty country road. The horse is sweating, it's a hot day. There's a man sitting over on a fence along the side of the road, and the farmer pulls his wagon over and says, how much longer does this hill last? And the man on the fence says, you ain't on a hill, your hind wheels done fell off. <laughs> so people complain to God about what a terrible uphill pull the world is. It may be the problem is not so much in the world as in the fact their lives are in poor repair. The world seems a terrible uphill pull when your hind wheels have done fell off. People who say they can't cope with circumstances ought to stop blaming the circumstances and get their minds and their hearts and their souls and their attitudes and their thinking right, and the circumstances of life will be a whole lot easier to handle. The road is easier when you fix your wagon. And the issues and the decisions and the problems and possibilities of existence are dealt with far more competently when your heart is filled with love and the soul is filled with faith. It's time people stopped complaining about the road and started fixing their wagons. People blame God for too many problems they bring on themselves because God is infinitely good. The experience of fellowship with God is inexpressibly rich, and yet it is very, very real. There's a story told by one of the biographers of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Both Emerson and Thomas Carlyle had read each other's books, and they were great admirers of each other's thinking and philosophy on many points. But between them lay the Atlantic Ocean. Then at last, Emerson sailed for Europe, and the long-awaited meeting between these two men took place at Thomas Carlyle's home. They greeted each other, they talked for a bit, but then as the evening wore on, the two of them fell into silence, sitting before the fireplace next to each other, just looking into the flames and the embers, and according to the story, several hours passed by without either one of them saying another word. At last, when it was time for Emerson to go, Carlyle conducted him to the door and parted with these words, I, Mon, and haven't we had a grand time? Their fellowship was far too deep a thing for words that night. So it is, and so it comes to be with God. There will be times when simply being with God will be the most important thing. There will be times when you haven't a thing to say, but will learn to enter into the sacred experience of simply enjoying God in quiet fellowship. That is an experience too deep for words. One time on television, during a newsreel, I saw a film clip of a West Virginia coal mine. It was an explosion and cave-in. During the course of it, it showed one old miner going back down into the crumbling shaft to search for his son, who was a miner too, and who had been underground when the explosion occurred. The old man was risking his own life to try to find his boy, and later the newsreel showed him bringing out his son. He'd found him lying unconscious and brought him back up. Both men were sooty and black with coal dust, but the sight of the joy on that weary father's coal-smudged, tear-stained face is one I will never, ever forget. And such is the living love of the living God for every person. God's Spirit comes down where we are and brings hope and love and strength in every hour of need, if only we will have the faith to claim it, to appropriate it, and to accept it. Who knows the potentials which God has placed within each one of us if we'd only dare to believe they're there? God doesn't make junk. And as sons and daughters of God, he has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. Some years ago, there was a short story called Mr. Smedley's Guest. It was about a man named Mr. Smedley who was rich and whose mind was totally absorbed in stocks and bonds, and who made no time for the meanings and the values and the spiritual things of life. 
And according to the story, one evening while his family was away, Mr. Smedley fell asleep in his easy chair, but he was suddenly awakened by an uninvited visitor who came to the door and walked in when Smedley opened it and sat down and started to talk. Mr. Smedley was, at first, incensed at the boldness of his guest, but the stranger was so charming in his manner and so rich in his character that Smedley soon became delighted talking with him as the guest spoke both brilliantly and profoundly of many ideals which Smedley himself had once held and of which he had once dreamed. The strange guest spoke of a book he had written, played at the piano a piece he had composed, and spoke of the high purposes of his life, and Smedley sat entranced by his unbidden visitor. And when at last his guest arose to leave, Mr. Smedley expressed delight at his unexpected visit, but then faltered and said that he hadn't quite caught the visitor's name, and asked, but who are you? And the guest replied, I am the man you might have been, and vanished. And then Mr. Smedley awoke. Consider well for a moment the man or the woman you might have been. But then consider the person you yet might be and yet might become. Because God has a will and wisdom, a power and purpose for every human life, a plan for this planet, and a reason for every human being being alive. And as it has been said, when God and man go into partnership, tremendous things begin to happen. The historian John R. Ewers writes that during the mid-1800s and the